Hello, everyone. Welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. My name is Claire Haley. I'm the Strategic Communications Director for the History Center and the coordinator of these talks. I'm so thrilled to be welcoming you all tonight for this great discussion on local history featuring Martin Padgett and Philip Rafshoon. So of course you can purchase a copy of Martin's book. We highly encourage that you do so. Uh, we are, our official bookseller tonight is Acapella Books. I'll be posting a link to do that shortly in the chat. And Martin's actually gonna be there later this month signing books. So if you're interested in that, um, you'll have an opportunity to get a signed copy from him. Um, so I'm gonna briefly introduce tonight's speakers and then turn it over to them. So tonight we're welcoming Martin Padgett. He is the author of his, of his new book, A Night at the Sweet Gum Head, Drag, Drugs, Disco, and Atlanta's Gay Revolution. He has an MFA from the University of Georgia's Grady College of Journalism and received a 2019 Lambda Literary Fellowship. He has written for the Oxford American, Gravy, Details, and Business Week, and he lives in Atlanta, Georgia. He will be in conversation tonight with Philip Rafshoon. Philip was the founder and operator of Outright, Atlanta's LGBTQ bookstore and coffee house from 1993 to 2012. He has served as the program director for the AJC Decatur Book Festival, and he now works as a director of member engagement for Midtown Alliance. He is also a member of Atlanta Mayor's LGBTQ Advisory Board. Martin, Philip, welcome to Atlanta History Center virtually this evening. We are absolutely thrilled that you are joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Claire. And hello, Marty. How are you tonight? I'm doing well. It's great to see you again. Good to see you again. Congratulations on the book. Happy, happy Pride Month. It feels like it's a, it's a really big one this year. It's our first, hopefully, post-Trump Pride Month. And I think we're going post-COVID. So everybody's really celebrating. And more reason to celebrate is the launch of your, your new book. Uh, I'm really honored to be here tonight and, and speak with you, uh, particularly because Sweet Gumhead was the first bar I was ever in. <laughs> I'm still blown away by that. Yeah. I, uh, I've met a lot of people who tell me that and not everyone remembers that it was their first bar that they went to because they may have had a few drinks, may have had some other stuff. Yeah, well, I don't remember exactly how I got there, but <laughs> you know, there's so many people who have a home bar, a main bar, something that they identify with. And when I first heard about this book and heard that I was going to be interviewing you, I, I wondered why Sweet Gumhead? How did, how did you discover it? So I discovered it because I started the MFA program at, at Georgia and I knew I wanted to write something about Atlanta. I had lived here long enough and I thought, uh, I think I know some of the city well enough. And uh, my first idea was to write a book starting in downtown and I wanted to do it starting the day after Dr. King was assassinated, the start of the modern era of Atlanta history. I didn't think that anybody had chronicled what happened and you know how the city created itself afterwards. You know after it uh, dis after it took the shape of modern Atlanta. I went through a few versions of it, and it was kind of sprawling and you know altogether appropriate for Atlanta. It was complicated, um, so I was encouraged by one of my mentors in the program to keep bringing things in tighter, closer to my neighborhood. And my neighborhood was Cheshire Bridge Road. When I first moved here, I had a place up uh, the Art Deco condos that are uh, up on uh, close to the highway entrance. Still there. And I, yeah, still there, um, amazingly so. Um, I, I didn't really know about the Sweet Gumhead until I read the name in a story in Atlanta Magazine. It was an interview with Lena Lust and she mentioned it. And I thought, I wonder why it's named that not knowing that this was the place to be in Atlanta in the 1970s. And I had missed out. And in fact, the club was next door to the place where I had settled. And I didn't even know about it. Wow, it's amazing that it had been so forgotten. You, you start the book, I mean, you've really created a fascinating piece of history of the community and the city in, the, in a decade, but, but you started in, in 69 with, with, with a raid at the Ansley Mall mini cinema uh, when they were playing uh, Andy Warhol's Lonesome Cowboys. And they arrested some people, but, but it wasn't really like Stonewall for Atlanta, was it? There were a lot of people arrested. It was just, you know, it was an extension of that, um, 
the invisible borders of the police state, as I put it in the book. Um, you know, LGBT people, queer people were told, this is what you're allowed to do. And it's not, you're not allowed to be a public. And, you know, this movie was uh, an affront to old traditional Atlanta too. So the fact that it was selected for the targeting by the police, um, it, was, it was typical of what was going on. And you know, the community finally had decided that it had enough. And in the wake of that is when the first local chapter of the Gay Liberation Front formed. Interesting timing. You, you, the story is a lot about, about Sweet Gumhead. It's about a lot more. But before Sweet Gumhead opened, uh, what, what was drag like in Atlanta? Was it, was it as big as it is, was in the 70s? No. So uh, luckily, I've, I've gotten to read all these columns that were written by, some, you know, Diamond Lil wrote a column for The Great Speckled Bird and spoke a lot in a very elliptical, very, um, very grandiose way about it being chased from the stage to the beer cooler because they had to hide because the police would come in and prosecute anybody who wasn't wearing at least two or three pieces of men's clothing. Um, you know, drag was sub rosa. It was usually performed in basements and parties, and it had to hide from the authorities for a long time. So in 71, shortly after the book starts, Frank Powell, who owned bars here already, uh, opened the Sweet Gumhead. How, how was it different than, than anything before it? What Frank said at the time in interviews and what uh, a lot of the performers and the people who work there say is you know, the physical construct of the Gumhead was very different. Not only was it on Cheshire Bridge Road, it was, you know, there were a couple of clubs on Potts, there were a couple on Peachtree. Uh, uh, and then of course, what's Trader Joe's now across from uh, Midtown High School was uh, Chuck's Rathskeller. It was, a, it was a big place, but it had relatively short life. So when clubs started to gravitate out toward Cheshire Bridge Road, they were inheriting these buildings that were built for something else. The Gumhead happened to be a few different clubs before then. It was called um, the Cheshire Cat uh, not long before. And uh, it was built as like a supper club theater. And these successive clubs that were in it, uh, the Cheshire Cat was uh, more like a go-go bar. And Sonny and Cher performed there for a four month stint in 1969. It was big enough to hold a lot of people. And um, Charlie Brown, I think, described it to me. It was like walking into a Roman arena. You'd have people overhead of you stomping on the floor up where the dressings were more, the dressing rooms were. You'd have people wrapped around the sides trying to jam in. They could, you know, nominally seat 300 people, but usually more than that if it was a very popular show from one of the very popular stars. I remember walking in and it was everywhere above you. There was people everywhere. No. Yeah. Yeah, and it, that made it very different from, you know, uh, some typical clubs, even some of the clubs that uh, John Greenwell explains, you know, in the book that he performed in, like uh, uh, Cruise Quarters was downstairs in, in Highlands. It was a basement and it barely had a, a performing stage and it was just like a hallway downstairs, no windows, just kind of grimy. Mm -hmm. um, the grimy part, I understand, was part of this week I'm had a lure too. So maybe you can tell us all about that. <laughs> Well, as Diamond Lillo always said, it was glamour there. It was a different type of show. It was Vegas. It was it was big time. Yeah, and and that is echoed throughout. I think people had taken to think of drag as still as this um, forbidden art, but you put it in a context like that, and in a club where James Brown had played to open a club called Soul City, mm -hmm. um, it, it was in that building right before the Gumhead. Um, that's a big difference. That's kind of honoring the art form. Yeah, exactly. Well, there, there were so many famous entertainers that, that were there. Uh, Satanville, uh, LaVita Allen, Hot Chocolate, who I believe is still in, performing. Uh, but yep. you chose to tell the story of John Greenwell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know from reading the book, he was the biggest star there was. But, but tell me a little bit about how he got his start and, and, and maybe why he became so big and famous. John explains it that <clears throat> it was uh, almost accidental that when he moved to Atlanta, he had roommates who were bouncers at bars and they had given a place to sleep for some of the drag acts that were touring town. And when he met Crystal Blue, um, he was just fascinated by her that she could totally transform herself and create this other identity. 
And he also realized that he was not old enough to get into a nightclub with being 20 years old. The uh, age was 21 at that point. So drag got him in the clubs and it also got him a job with more, you know, making more money than the drugstore where he worked. That, wor that worked to establish him as a, as a performer, but from there he was going to have to get much better over time and get more sophisticated because the competition from, you know, the performers, like you're saying, uh, over the course of the decade, drag really got professionalized mm -hmm. and um, pageants developed and eventually became multi-night draws that attracted local news and television. And, uh, you know, it, the, the, uh, the move was towards becoming professional celebrities and that in turn drew other celebrities to come and watch them. So it really fed on itself. Yeah. So John, like you came here from Birmingham, didn't come here for drag. And well, he came from Huntsville. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. from Alabama. So yeah. as, as Rachel Wells, he, he, he added a, a shtick to it. And that was uh, Reba. Reba was one of six, five or six boa constrictors. Um, he adopted the original boa constrictor at Lenox Mall. And over time, um, you know, several Rebas would come and go. Um, and he developed this sort of like an Amazon warrior act where he could wrap Reba around him and perform on stage. And uh, he would eventually put that in, into the closet again. He wouldn't use that always for his act. His real, his, his showstopper became uh, performing numbers from Jesus Christ Superstar. And that took some technical skill and some physical perfection. And John, you know, the pictures you see of him performing as Rachel Wells, he, he had the body to do anything he wanted to on stage. And he had the nerve to do it too. And to me, that was really instructive. Not, not a traditional dragon, you might say. No, and that, but that was also an era where um, even he and some other performers had mentors who did this kind of traditional drag, big flowy gowns and you know, sort of the Shirley Basie. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you have Lily White who would show up for pageants in a bloodstained wedding dress and John who was slinging a boa constrictor around. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, there, were, there were many different offshoots and, diff and varieties of drag as an art. Indeed. You, you have another track in, in the book, and that's the story of Bill Smith. So you, you have the activist track. And tell us a little bit about Bill, how he got mm -hmm. started in activism in Atlanta. Bill, uh, his family was from Atlanta. His father worked for the city's motor vehicle department. And his mother uh, raised the children and you know, made sure they were educated. And uh, they lived in different parts of town. And uh, in Decatur, he went to high school, started school at Oxford, at Emory at Oxford, and then eventually transferred to Georgia State, where he kind of actualized himself. Um, you, know, you might say he radicalized himself there. He became one of the leaders of the LGBT civil rights movement, which was just in its infancy. Um, he helped lead the first chapter of the GLF. Um, he helped organize some of the first pride parades. And then he became the very visible face of the LGBT community when he was named to the CRC, which was the Community Relations Commission. It was sort of the, the intermediary trying to implement um, desegregation at the neighborhood level, at the, at the political level. Um, but it, its mission really grew over a few years to include uh, you know, more presence for the queer community, for one. But he was the one, I mean, it was his appointment that, that, that made it include the queer or the gay community, as we called it at the time. Well, there was one person who served before him, Charlie St. John. And okay. after a year, he was fired from, from the committee. Uh, he had tried to leaflet at the AJC for pride. And uh, the police also tossed his apartment looking for drugs convinced that he had drugs and you know it was it was seen by some people as an easy subtext to send a message it does indeed now bill and burl boykin and one other they, they went to visit the governor yeah and klaus smith was a third yeah our governor was was jimmy carter and they were asking for governor carter to end the sodomy laws yeah it didn't go so well, did it? It didn't go very well at all. Uh, 
you know, Carter, when he ran in 1970, had to uh, play a few fields of, uh, to establish political domain. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, one of those was appealing to people who'd rather see a segregated Georgia. Uh, the day of his inauguration, he disavowed all that in his inauguration speech. But he still was not open to queer civil rights. Um, when they went to see him, uh, they demanded that he rescind these sodomy laws, which had just been changed to include women for the first time. So lesbians could also be convicted. And I think the sentencing was 20 years. Uh, it was a severe penalty. Not many people were prosecuted under it, but it was still- it's Always there. Not, not just, it was there, it was strengthened as, as law after that. And, uh, you know, it, they went to Carter's open office hours, you know, an idea we could never, that would never happen today, where he just had 15 minutes where people could come in and they demanded an end to the sodomy laws. And Governor Carter said no, flatly, and mm -hmm. had them removed from his office. And that was about the end of that. Yeah. So even though this is the time where Atlanta was becoming a mecca for gay people of all stripes, it was still a pretty tough time. There was sodomy laws. There was um, police raids. There was, um, it was, it was, it was tough to be gay in Atlanta in the early seventies. And the police raids diminished somewhat. You know, Sam, Mayor Marcel had said, leave the drag queens alone. Gay bars, you know, there was just this, this realization that fighting gay bars themselves was a losing battle. But there was still this harassment at the garden variety level. And I say that because Piedmont Park was a big place where queer people were harassed. And there were also straight people who would come into town to harass queer people because they knew that that's where they gathered. So that, of course, still hasn't ended. Yeah, Piedmont Park was really the center of the community for a long time. In fact, if you, mm -hmm. you draw a map of all the bars that grew up in the 70s and 80s and 90s, Piedmont Park is always at the center of it. Central to it. And it, it, it from the start of Atlanta's pride movement, it was, the, it was the end of the protest parades when they were held. It was the gathering place in the few years where they had a, a, what they called a family gathering, a, a picnic at Pride instead. I think that was 75 or 74 and 75. Um, it was the end of the parade. You know, when the parade was manageable enough, when it wasn't 300,000 people, you know, when, when Pride wasn't a physical installation that took days to move into the park. Right, it was. Now, the key politician in the story, of course, is uh, Mayor Maynard Jackson. He was, uh, he mm -hmm. came into office in 74 to 82. He was a supporter of the LGBTQ community in ways that people hadn't been before. That's fair to say, um, and and he he did things he does things in the book that I still reread now, and I think oh that was even a little bit more radical than I thought. He wrote a letter explaining to the Advocate, which had written a story about him saying that he was no friend to the queer community. Jackson wrote a letter back to the Advocate and said. Absolutely not. You know, gay rights are just as important to me as all other civil rights. And I, you have to think about the positioning of what the advocate was at the time. Some people would have still considered it pornography. And this is the mayor of Atlanta, the first black mayor of Atlanta, putting himself on the line to say, this is how it's going to be. There were complications later on um, when Mayor Jackson declared uh, Gay Pride Day in 1976. The immediate blowback was the Buckhead business community, and uh, you know, they, they built an organization, used it as a stalking horse to express their anti-gay views. That's and true. the next- the citizens, for de the citizens for a decent Atlanta. Yeah, we're not sure what the version of decent was, but their, their version of decent was at least the mayor not you know, having to rescind this proclamation, which he flatly refused to do. In 1977 though, the next year, he did not say the words gay pride. It was civil liberties days. And it was a blanket term that did include sexual orientation, but um, very fine threading of that political needle. Mm -hmm. And he would not declare a gay pride day again during his administration, at least during his two consecutive administrations. So he walked it back. He walked it back, but he also walked on Peachtree Street, shook hands of protesters during the 77 pride. So you have to give him as much credit for the physical presence and for the doing and being and extending himself as, as you have to take him to task for you know, letting that dictate it. Of course, 77 pride happened during a re-election year. Mm -hmm. 
Right, right, right. Now, now Frank Powell, who who owned the Sweet Gum Head, he mm-hmm. he wasn't real fond of pride. He wasn't fond of activists. He wasn't fond of radicals. Uh, so even though he opened this fabulous bar and lots of fabulous bars, uh, he didn't start out being in favor of combining activism and bar life. Not in the beginning, not during the time that I'm, I'm writing about in the book. Um, he had people thrown out of the Cove, which he owned a part of uh, during 1972 Pride. Uh, you know, Bill Smith and others, uh, Dave Hayward, they were leafleting to let people know about what was going to go on that year. And um, Frank had them tossed out of the Cove and the Sweet Gum Head, they were just told to leave. Later on, you know, Frank would sell the Sweet Gum Head in 1974 and he would gradually own a, and operate a succession of bars. Uh, but by the 80s, he was performing commitment ceremonies at his bars. Mm-hmm. He, so, had been raised, he had been raised a fundamentalist and, and had gone to Bob Jones University and was going to train to be a preacher. His trajectory is so interesting, and I, I wish there was even more about him because that's, kind of, that's, that's the kind of tale that's endemic to the South. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So all the time, you know, and part of it is probably because with the bars opening and expanding, all these people were moving to Atlanta, they were becoming more active, and I guess it, he finally was convinced that it all fed together. It, he, he was also convinced because occasionally he would dress up in drag too. And I think as he got more comfortable with you know, politics as being sort of a form of drag, you could put that on too. Um, he would he apparently had this costume made up that was Catherine the Great and it was stunning. And he would wear it like once or twice a year. And, you know, a few drinks later and it'd be halfway off. And I wish I was there those nights. Yep. Me too. <laughs> Or that, just see a picture of it. Yeah. M- music plays such a key role in the book and in the story. Every chapter is a is another song. And I found on Spotify this fabulous playlist that you have uh, all about A Night at the Sweet Gumhead. Um, but it, if, if you look at the playlist, it's not traditional, what you would think, gay anthems that one would see these days. Not all disco. Can you tell us a little bit about the music in the book? I needed something to help me imagine the book. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you just have to decompress and not think about what you're thinking about. Uh, let it happen in the background. So I would hop in my car and drive around the perimeter, make a lap and turn on this playlist. And it's songs that were played inside the nightclub. And you know, the thing about drag is performers choose songs because they have deep meaning. You know, they're, when they're performing, they don't have to worry about if they're hitting the right note, if you know if the staging is perfect, they're channeling the emotion that they read into the song and that they're reading out of it. So it really is meaningful to them. And when I hear songs like, you know, one of Hot Chocolate's best pageant winning numbers is if my friends could see me now. Mm-hmm. And in my head, it was always the Broadway version, Sweet Charity, until I learned about the Linda Clifford disco version, which is fantastic. Uh, I learned, I discovered a lot of new music, uh, and some Tavares. And it, I learned about some songs in the funniest ways too. I would read in Facebook groups and all of a sudden there's another song name and I get to add it to the list. Um, and when I wrote the book, I chose song names as the titles of the chapters because they're pivotal moments that describe sort of what's going on in that chapter, but it's also anthemic moments. And the one that gave me the most pause was in 1978 when uh, the queer community moved Pride up to protest Anita Bryant's speech at the Southern Baptist Convention. And the song that was sung sometimes in protest was called Fuck Anita Bryant. And it was this country song written by the guy who wrote Take This Job and Shove It. And I can keep going on that. This is my favorite rabbit hole to go down. There are so many stories behind these, these songs and just how they integrate into these performers' stage lives. Um, it, I, I even omitted one and uh, 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 a colleague uh, pointed it out. I did nothing with Diana Ross and I'm coming out. And then I read a great story about how Niall Rogers had written it in response to seeing drag queens performing in Manhattan. 
Like that's awesome. That's awesome. But you know, you've yeah. got a lot of stuff in here that 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 I learned about, like um, the used corporation, rock the boat. I, I didn't realize yeah. that it was it was a song that wasn't going anywhere, and then it went into the gay clubs, got remixed, mm -hmm. and then became an enormous hit. So gays have such an influence on music so often, and I think it's <laughs> because a lot of us grew up in the nightclubs. And, and that ha happened a couple times with Gloria Gaynor songs too, where there were club hits long before they became popular in on America's Top 40. Uh, and, and that's part of the fun in, in decoding, you know, how did this song begin and what happened to it along the way? And it's, it's the music that was playing when I was growing up and I didn't understand why I grokked to it so well. And now I get it. Like rock the boat. Yeah, exactly. So Sweet Gumhead got a lot of celebrities coming to the, to the club. Mm -hmm. Liberace, Waylon Flowers and Madam. Mm -hmm. Paul Lind. Paul Lind was there often too um, and judged a couple of, uh, let's call them pageants there. Um, and supposedly Dolly Parton was there a couple of times. Um, Melissa Manchester. Yeah, Melissa Manchester, who was very kind when we spoke and just had everything to say wonderful about uh, John Gorimwell and the other performers. And John has pictures on his personal site uh, with Melissa backstage and they became friendly and uh, just really wonderful. She has some great stories. And Burt Reynolds. And Burt Reynolds. Uh, yeah, <laughs> apparently everybody was just drooling over that, the fact that he was in the club. And, um, you know, he, he, uh, he made John Greenwell as Rachel Wells made such an impression on him that when Sharky's Machine was being filmed here, uh, didn't have to audition. She was cast instantly. Yeah, I noticed in, in the book, you wrote that when he left Gumhead, he went down to Mrs. Peace. Which uh, oh, is that? Or is that a the, rumor, or was no, that the truth? No, apparently, uh, you know, he was comfortable enough in in who and who, who he was, who he was hanging out with. That was just it was really not. I think he just wanted to see and be seen, and Atlanta was comfortable for him. You know, he was he was filming movies here long before Georgia's film industry became like a real film industry. He brought production of Gator here and. It was before Cannonball Run, and uh, I think he considered Georgia a second home. Of course, he did go to Florida, so we have to just, you know, have to get that out there. <laughs> right, right, right. So, how how long did it take you to write to write this book? When when did you get started on it? I started in fall of 2016. I think it was. Uh, I, I realized after I'd finished the first draft of it, um, I just missed speaking with some people. Guy Lil had passed away in August of 2016. Never got to speak with her in person, but she left this rich vein of interviews and recordings and things where I could see and, and hear. Um, you know, it took a long time, and uh, there there are lots of uh, rabbit holes to go down. But the one that I don't recommend going down is the Fulton County Courthouse or the Atlanta Police Department looking for records. They're not easy to navigate, and the time frame is is kind of problematic because that's when they had started purging records before then. So I, I can't tell you about Bill Smith's arrests because the records have been destroyed. I can show you the court record and show what happened to him as a result. Uh, but, you know, Bill's trajectory was an unhappy one the last few years of his life. And he ended up taking his own life in, in Northside Hospital parking lot. Um, lots of speculation from friends as to what was going on and had lots of difficulties emotionally and, and in business and uh, yeah, I wish we were here to say something about it. Yeah, well, it seems like he, he had a lot of tragedies leading up to that. He lost the barb. Yeah. Uh, he had arrests. Uh, he had a challenging yeah. time at that time. That was- uh, He did. That was towards the end of the book. Things went, set, went really bad for him. He took his life. Uh, yeah. The chapter's called Tragedy. And it's it's a it's a it's I think it's sort of a preface to to what happened next, which was uh, the ultimate tragedy for our community. And it's it's it's, it's kind of hard to to talk about. It's been mm -hmm. forty years since the first reports of of AIDS that we just marked this past yeah. Saturday, and that yeah. was was the timing of the end of the club, but the club 
it's it's it seems like it was it was going to happen anyway. And I'm wondering if you got a sense of how much AIDS crisis had to do with the closing of the club. Whether oh, was- I, I, yeah, I don't think anybody put the two together. Atlanta, there were a few people who uh, were known to have, have at least been in a in 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 the course of AIDS during 1981. Um, you know, a couple of people that I mentioned in the epilogue eventually passed from AIDS. Uh, Levita Allen uh, was the first that a lot of people remember in, in 1984 and uh, John Austin later in 1995. Um, the timing was, you know, in July of 1981, the New York Times had written a first story about a rare cancer affecting 41 homosexuals. The club closed about eight weeks later. Uh, it, it had been going through some difficulty, but, you know, as far as most of the performers know, it wasn't real financial hardship. It was just you know, bars tended to lose their luster after a couple of years anyway, and the Sweet Gum Head had been around for almost 10 years at that point. Um, mm-hmm. And usually that's the time when bars go through renovation and change names and change themes anyway. Um, but to people who are involved, they already felt like it was the change of an era before they realized uh, you know, what, what was coming. Um, Although I did, you know, before, before he died, Burl Boykin did tell me that um, in 1979 that he had friends in Philadelphia who knew that something was happening and that, you know, it was being covered up in his words. And, and that was a Holocaust coming again in, in his words. He, um, you know, there were people who were getting ill already. And um, it's, it's one of those epochal moments that we'll recognize and why I chose to write the story because it, you know, so many people were occupied with helping their friends and, you know, seeing them through at the end of their lives that for this decade was forgotten by some. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's certainly the 70s were just such a hopeful decade where it started out for a community where there were police raids and, 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 and harassment and things were mm-hmm. really coming along and freedom was on the horizon. And, you know, we hadn't really thought about gay marriage and things of that nature, but, but maybe sodomy laws would be overturned at some point. So to have everything just torn down within a few years by AIDS was, was horrific to live through. Um, I think, go ahead. And and, and to build on that, I I think we tend to structure queer history around New York and San Francisco, but you think about Atlanta, head of the CDC, um, it, it was a pivotal place where this, where the, the movement had to become a movement. You know, the seventies were, was where allies came together. Um, and if it was going to be successful in the South, it had to be successful here. So it's, I, I didn't want this part, this geographical part of queer history to be overlooked. Well, you did a good job of explaining the story. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that I noticed is that John Greenwell and Bill Smith, I don't think they ever, did they ever meet? Did they know each other? John thinks they may have met once. And mm-hmm. to me, that ultimately wasn't that important because there is this, I, I wanted to tell the stories together as activist and non-activist and their roles change. You know, it, mm-hmm. And I thought about this you know, a couple of weeks ago that John, John's drag was a form of activism. And to Bill, mm-hmm. activism was a sort of drag because it was a personality he put on when he wasn't running an escort agency or being the publisher of a newspaper or, or being a member of the city government to, to the extent that he was at the CRC. Um, the roles changed in 1978. And in general, that also became when the politicization of the gay clubs just became part of what they did. Uh, they were fundraising for the March on Washington. That, that would become fundraising to help friends and, and lovers who had contracted AIDS. You know, it, they became not just a social nexus, but a political nexus. So in some ways, their lives were parallel. They were running in the, the same circles. Bill, yeah. was, Bill was certainly at the clubs. He had his young mm-hmm. men's agency. And, and I find it fascinating because... When I was trying to open outright, some people told me not to do it. The community would never come together. The people that went to the bars were not the same people that were in activism. And I said, well, that's funny because I see the same people everywhere I go. So it, it always, it interests me the way they, um, 
their lives kind of went parallel, were parallel for, yeah. for a set period of time. When, when you were, a st- uh, oh, I'm ahead. sorry, uh, you know, a story where two people always orbit around each other and don't intersect. That's kind of interesting to me what's in between them. And what's in between them is the square Atlanta. And that gives me the space to tell that story without having to say it directly. Wait, when you were writing this book, what, 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 what did you learn that surprised you the most? Something that you just thought, I never, ever would have expected that. This is where I say that's a good question and, and stop for a second to gather my thoughts. Um, I, I suppose that, um, well, uh, talk about uh, talk about RuPaul. I knew that RuPaul had moved to Atlanta in the seven Atlanta in the seventies, and I know that you know, from YouTube videos where he's recording himself saying, "I'm leaving Atlanta." You know, I'm kind of kind of done with this scene. I'm going to New York. Um, what surprised me is that um, he's just one example of Atlanta providing this very fertile ground for people to express themselves. You know, for them to seize on their identity. And I guess the surprise is that that's no different from me than it is from John Greenwell, than it was from Bill Smith, than it was to any queer person who might come here or might go to any other city. You know, there's the common thread is here's where you think the pieces for your for your next identity or, or or your true identity are going to be, and you can pull them together. And the fact that Atlanta is this place where people gravitate to do that, it's kind of fabulous. It is indeed. It is indeed. You, you've got a lot of, I mean, it's a, it's a story of disco. It's a story about drugs. You spoke with a lot of people while, um, while researching this story. You spoke with Burl Boykin, Dave Hayward, yeah. Maria Helena Dolan, uh, Leslie Jordan. Did, yeah. I, know, I know Leslie Jordan didn't ask you this. Did, did anybody say, would you leave something out of here? Is there something I don't want you to put in this book? Not really. The opposite was true. <laughs> the opposite was true. I, I, I'm hearing all these stories, and people are saying things that you know you would think you might want that behind a, an archival wall or something like. Well, what does it matter at this point? <laughs> it, it, I, I'm so happy that people are so vested in telling their lives, and you know this is part of the part of the education of uh, MFA program that that I got was learning to trust people, and when you trust them and and want to know more about them and have a in, true interest in their story, they're more than willing to tell you and to explain why, and because they want, they want people to remember them and more to the point, especially with Bill Smith, you know, his friends want you to remember who he was because of the way he passed, not a lot of people did. And he was such an important figure and did so much in, in, for the community. I think so. And, and there are a lot of people who were working for the gay civil rights movement in the seventies. Um, his story is just so fascinating. And a lot of it was put down too. It was, it was in the paper itself. He would write a column in every newspaper. He was in the New York Times. He was in the Washington Post. Uh, you know, that's one of the problems with history is we can usually only go back to people who documented their lives in some way. So it was helpful that all those things were there and I didn't have to do a lot of reconstruction through other people. Um, but you know, it's still a difficult story to tell even even if you're just focused on what was in his own words, you can see some of the trouble coming to, to mind in the later years. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would have been a lot easier to put the, easier to put the history together if we had cell phones back then. But you know, really glad that we didn't for a lot of reasons. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have said that um, they don't remember a lot, and uh, <laughs> you know, they, they're they're they too are glad that they didn't live in a cell phone era. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, at some point, we, we miss out on that too. Um, one of the things I've talked recently about is you know, drag has developed this whole television and Instagram persona, and mm-hmm. at the same time, it's been absent from clubs because of COVID. So that has created this separation. So there's a distinct version of that art form that exists, you know, kind of only in the ether, um, and that's something that anybody can watch, but you really need to experience it live. Mm-hmm. So you know, I, I really wish I'd experienced some of this live. Well, maybe now that we have learned our lessons from COVID of one of those things might be, don't do everything online, get out there and be in front of people. It might yeah. come back. There's a, there's, a, there's a new drag club in Atlanta that opened this weekend. And we need places like that to be together as a community. And I get concerned when neighborhoods have, have kind of given way to more apartment buildings. You know, you drive down Treasure Bridge Road now and there's new apartments and 
strip clubs are being torn down to build communities and you know, what kind of community are they building? Uh, I don't know. I can just tell you that the place where I used to go, I mean, I went to hoedowns. It's in the book. You know, the very first hoedowns is now part of the strip club Onyx that's on Cheshire Bridge Road. And then it moved and now it's not anywhere. And I, I miss it. Yep. Well, we have one dance club left in the gay community. Two, maybe three. My God, is it open at like four in the afternoon? Because that's the only time I would end up it's, going there. It's, it's not bad, like me. eight o'clock. Maybe on Saturdays. What? What? Mm. Well, this is a great history. What's What's next for you? What What are you looking at writing next? I, I think there's more to the story. I think there's more to the story of Atlanta in the 1980s. Um, mm. I would love to do something like Armistice Maupin did, and have a Tales of the City that just recasts and adds new characters and talks about other other things. And Atlanta in the 80s was kind of a fascinating place too. So I'm trying, I'm mulling over and researching and speaking with some people to see how I might frame it. That would be fascinating. Uh, I see we have a lot of questions here. So I'll, sure. bet, I'll bet some of them would want to be in the, in, the, uh, in the book on the 80s. Uh, I hope so. Do you think now that the book is out and now that we are uh, starting to be able to get out in, in real life, do you think there'd be a uh, sweet gumhead reunion again? I hope so. There was one in 2018 uh, down at uh, Amsterdam, Atlanta. And a lot of the performers showed up and John Greenwell came down from Kentucky. He didn't perform, but you know he was... He was in the audience and everyone was happy and surprised to see him. And it's the first place I got to see Dina Jacobs perform and Tina DeVore and it was, it was wonderful. When they had closed the gum head, I guess they had a reunion in 1985, not long after. And it was packed for five hours for a nonstop show, no disco breaks. So I, I, I hope, I hope that they'll do another one. Yeah, I hope so too. Have other um, drag queens among us uh, reacted to this body of work? Have you heard from other performers? Uh, I haven't heard from anyone who wasn't in the book. I've spoken with all the performers that uh, were, were a part of the story. Um, I hope that they're reading it. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that they see a little bit of themselves in it. I hope I hope they they look at the people in the book as as the forerunners of what they're doing today. Uh, you know, I, I really hope that uh, as many performers as want to read it will reach out to me because I'd be glad to send them a copy just because I love the fact that I was able to do this and I'm still you know, fascinated by it. And your website is Martin, Martin Paget. That is. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the Sweet Gumhead get its name? It's in the Sweet book. Sweet Gumhead, <laughs> it's, it's in the book. There's the... Uh, and it's, uh, I, I adapted part of it for uh, Oxford American too. And it, it goes into more depth about Frank Powell there. And some of that stuff was not in the final book too. Sweet Gumhead was the town where Frank Powell was from. It's in the Florida panhandle. It's really in the middle of nowhere. I drove through there once, uh, twice actually, um, once in December of 19. Um, it's Southwest of Geneva, Alabama. It's on the Choctawatchee Bay, one of the rivers that shoots off of that. It's just beautiful farmland. There's about five houses there wow. with miles between them. Yeah, it's just cattle country, every kind of produce. Um, and it's isolated from everything. There's not even a school there. Is it still a town? Sort of. The backstory is in the 30s, some local politician campaigned to get it included on maps because they thought that it could be something. So it wasn't even really a town when it was a town. Okay. And I, I kind of love that. It's an illusion. Here's another one. When, when researching the book and doing all the interviews, who were you starstruck by or, or maybe inspired by? Um, it's hard not to be starstruck. <laughs> everybody, but it's, it's hard not to be starstruck by hot chocolate because you, at the time, Larry Edwards was performing in a, a show on the Vegas Strip. And met me after the show, it was midnight. We were meeting a casino and I'm like, I'm, I'm having a meeting with a star at midnight on the Vegas Strip. Uh, and he's just wonderful and he, he loves entertaining. So uh, he was also in Sharknado 4 
And I think you haven't lived until you've spoken with somebody who was in Sharknado 4. And Miss Congeniality 2. Wow. That is uh, something. I, I, I guess I, I look at these artists, uh, you know, I'm trying to learn more about the art. So when I spoke to Leslie Jordan, it was just pure entertainment. It's just a joy to, to interview. And Melissa Manchester too, you know, they, they, they're, they're so intimately connected with their work. Uh, it's just a joy to hear them talk about it and how they interpreted what was going on at Atlanta Drag. Yeah, they, they definitely know, know a lot about that. Um, I have a question here about the fundraisers. <clears throat> Mary Jo Reicher, Vicky Gabriner, do you know anything about that? I, I do know a couple. Uh, I'm, I can't say the, the, de the details specifically, but again, this was this was another function of Sweet Gum had later in its duration, like 78. I think the Vicky Gabriner fundraiser was there. Um, and I can't, I won't say what it was about because I can't specifically remember. But it was at the time when John Austin was managing the club and they really branched out to do, um, they were doing live action plays. They were reenacting entire Broadway musicals. They hosted the South debut of John Waters' Desperate Living, and they would do these other fundraisers too. Um, it eventually became the place where they raised a bunch of money to send four busloads of people to the March on Washington in 1979. So beyond strict drag disco, you know, this was a site of political activation. Well, it's it's they were it was a community center, in right? So right. many places. Uh, are there any? Are there any? pictures of people and the sweet gum head today and in and what is the building today the building today is a club that i'm not sure if it's open again or not because of covid but the club still exists you know the thing that fascinates still drive two miles down the road um that building is still there the the duncan dine is still there the drunken drag whatever you want to call right. it the building is there still there um happy herman's had a fire like last week the building is still standing, but you know there's scorched brickwork on the outside. Um, uh, you know, it, I can't remember what the club is now, but it, it's. I'm not even sure if it's open for business, but I have seen cars parked back there a few times that I've driven by. Yeah, I think I think it is open. I can't remember the name, um, but I did take a peek before the interview, and it's still it's still there. It's a strip club, very different, but probably the same setup inside. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, um, I just, I thought nothing like, I don't know what's open because of COVID or not. Right. Well, I think everything here is open. If, if it's open, it's open. Nothing's, nothing's temporarily, <laughs> temporarily closed anymore. Here, here's a question. Uh, so many gay bars like Sweet Gumhead and other businesses have closed some very recently. Why is that? Uh, before COVID, I assume the question is for, um, I think part of that is because maybe we feel less of a need to be sheltered inside with people that we describe or people that we call our own community. Um, you know, maybe, maybe smartphones have taken a lot of that away. Tinder, Bumble, any of the other app, apps that you can use to meet people, that takes part of the social function out of it. Um, but you know, community center is still a vital part of a community. Atlanta itself is 6 million people now. And in the beginning of this story, it was just a million. So we don't function the same way that we did before. Atlanta always reminded me of, of LA in some ways. It's like a collection of neighborhoods searching for a city. And our gay neighborhood was one of the neighborhoods searching for the greater city, you know, the greater idea of Atlanta. What is it? Um, I think we have all become part of Atlanta Incorporated now. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of people see less of a need to go to those specific places. We can we we can go anywhere. You know, I think yeah. there's a need to go. I personally I try to go at least once a week somewhere. Um, right, right. But it's it's hard for people to to commit to that. And I, I think with greater uh, comfort in being queer anywhere you are, you might be going to a gay bar in Jackson, Mississippi, or Joplin, Missouri, or or cooler Georgia, maybe there's one there. You know, I, I read more stories about smaller towns that can make queer bars work now and out and open and, and have, a, have a good business, at least before COVID. So I hope that's part of it. Yeah, hopefully that now that COVID is 
coming to a close, there'll be an opportunity for people to to open new clubs and, and bars and 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 a push to get out and be out at places. Yeah, they have to find that intersection of an affordable place combined with a city that is open minded to having things. You know, I, we both probably we both remember Sundays used to be the day to go out in Atlanta and that mm -hmm. got shut down really effectively in the early 2000s. And I missed that too. That was, that was one of the things that made Atlanta's gay life different from other cities. Yeah. Well, it's open again on Sundays. Uh, it just closes at midnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sunday Lord. blurs into Monday. Yeah. yeah. People at Backstreet, it blurs into Thursday. Yeah. yeah. It, it used to be, you know, solid from Thursday till, till Monday morning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right now, there's an effort to designate the Eagle as a historic site. Can the sites on Cheshire Bridge Road be so designated? Mm -hmm. I hope so. Um, um, you know, Atlanta has the potential, I think, of establishing a physical location that commemorates and that honors the queer community. And I think those are the most likely places. Um, you know, we have we have a community that I think is interested in seeing more of its history on display all the time. And my own personal desire would be to see that done in some semi-permanent way. Of course, I want to have it on Cheshire Bridge Road because that's my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. right? So, <clears throat> um, Somebody, uh, Bruce Garner designated that it is the now the 24K Club is the name of the club. Where Sweet okay. Garner is. I yeah, it's, it's, asked, where is it? And it's at the corner of Cheshire Bridge and Alta Avenue. So right, it's to... it's harder for me to see the normal way because there's that huge mm -hmm. storage unit now that used to be the Varsity Junior. You could see back there kind of easily. Uh, it, yeah, it's um, I, I wonder about Cheshire Bridge that it, it's always had this tenacious hold on uh, what the businesses that were there, and gentrification has never been quite able to take hold, but. Now there's apartments there that were never there and transit is coming. I think that will forever alter the character of the neighborhood and some of the things we don't want to alter. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's always changing and, you know, you, we just have to find other ways in other places and creative, creative people will find a way to, to make it work somehow. I hope so. Uh, we have a lot of thank yous and people that want to know if anybody was there. Uh, Atlanta Venture Sports had a combination of the Wiz and Wizard of Oz show. I, I'm, I believe they did. That became a really popular show to stage. It was one of the first productions where they took all the numbers from Wizard of Oz and performed them as a show in like 1972. And that just became a thing. Um, I, they eventually did the entire Chicago musical toward the end and, uh, you know, created flyers and everything for it. It was just, you know, it's been described as very professional and I'm sure it was completely entertaining too. It sounds like something, sounds like something we really wish there were cell phones for on that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Chicago, you could really sink your teeth into that. <laughs> M M Marty, what, if, what would you want somebody young that's reading this book to, to learn from it, to, to take away from the book? Um, or somebody of any- one that, yeah, well, anybody can choose the community that they want to be a part of and create themselves or recreate themselves in it. But that comes with uh, responsibility. You are responsible for keeping your community whole and for adding to it. And, I like to think that that's what I've done here. I, you know, a couple of friends, one who wrote a really kind blurb about it, said that this is a love letter to Atlanta. And it is. I really love this place and I love what it gave to me. So this is me paying back a little bit. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, thank you very much for this, this wonderful work. It's been a joy reading it over the past month. And, and looking forward to seeing you in person soon. And uh, yes. thank you for this gift to the community and, and best of luck with, with the future of this. I think you have a bright future with this work and whatever comes next. Thank you, I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you everybody for coming tonight too.